okay, I feel like I have to explain the second reading because if you read the second reading, you might get some bad ideas. All right, well, let me, let me explain. Here's the second reading. It was only, it's, only, it's only three sentences. I tell you, brothers and sisters, the time is running out. Here's why I have to explain it. From now on, let those having wives act as not having them. I don't want any bad things happening here, okay? All right? Let, <laughs> let's talk about this line here a little bit. St. Paul continues, those weeping has not weeping, those rejoicing has not rejoicing, those buying has not owning, those using the world has not using it fully. Here's another important line right here, the last line. For the world in its present form is passing away. Passing away. That's what the English translation gives us. In the Greek, it gives us a phrase that is used in the Greek theaters. And it refers to the changing of scenes or the changing of sets. You know, so back then, it's kind of like it is today. You go to a play, you go to a show, and they're done with the act, with the scene. And so the lights dim and the music plays and then you see those little shadows in the background changing the set, putting in a table, putting in chairs, taking the, the backdrop down, putting another backdrop in. That's the context. That's the, that's the word that St. Paul borrows from that we translate as passing away. The changing of the set. The world is in the midst of a change in scene. So not just the world changes scenes, right, all the time. But even our lives, we go through change after change after change. Some of you, if not most of you, have had this kind of change in scenery in your lifetime. You know, you, you, you start off as single, and then you start dating someone, that's a change of scene there, right? Things are different when you have a companion in life. And then you're engaged, and then there's a whole bunch of new changes in the engagement, and then you get married, and that's a big change, right? That's a big change there. And then even a bigger change, you start having kids. The scenery changes. <laughs> Your house that looks so nice and well-ordered, now you have kids and it looks like a tornado went through it every day, you know? And then they go off to college and now you have another change of scene in your life. Empty nest. And the house is back in order again. And then you have grandchildren and you babysit grandchildren. And then the house is once again ravaged by a tornado. I don't know what it is with kids and tornadoes, but it just seems to happen that way, right? Then we get even some more tragic changes of scenes in our lives. We start the things that we start to be able to do with our hands and with our bodies we're not able to do anymore. It's hard for us to walk up steps. We get sick. And then the biggest change of scene is the death of our companion, the death of our spouse, and then ultimately our own death. Our whole lifetime, we go through various acts and changes of sets. And there's really, if you're anything like me, as I get older, I hate change, right? I, when I was young, I never understood why Older people than me didn't like change or resistant to change, but as I'm, you know, getting into my mid 40s, I I can understand how ignorant I was. You know, you're so used to something in life, and everything is in an orderly way, and everything is comfortable, and everything's running smoothly, and then something changes, and you just 
get tired of learning new things, right? Get tired of learning new procedures. So what do we do with that? Because whether we like it or not, things are going to change in our lives. We can't avoid it. We wish things would remain the same, but we get older, our loved ones get older, so how do we handle it? And so quickly, there's two ways of handling this change, whatever it is in our life. There's the Jonah way in the first reading, or also Jonah slash Father Miller way. Okay, same thing. Jonah has presented a big change in his life to go to the city Nineveh to preach a message of repentance to people who don't know God at all. And he has to travel a far way to get there. And so he does the Father Miller method, and he, he runs in the opposite direction. All right, if you know the story of Jonah, Jonah runs in the opposite direction, gets on a boat, tries to get as far away from Nineveh as possible where our Lord wants him. And so it ends up, what, a, a big storm? The sailors throw him off into the water, and then a whale swallows him up, and then the whale, three days later, spits him out onto the shore of Nineveh. God always has his way of breaking through. But the Jonah way in our way looks like this. It could look like anger in our lives or frustration, where we're just a total bear to be around people because we're resistant to the changes that are coming in our lives. An example I've been using at the other masses, just think about like maybe your elderly mom or dad, you know, and then you tell them, you know, hey, maybe it's time to move to a smaller house. Maybe it's time to move to a house that doesn't have stairs. Maybe there's time to a house where it doesn't take much to maintain and everything about the request makes sense, right? Smaller house, no stairs, you're getting older. But what do they do? They give you a hard time, right? They really they give you a hard time, absolutely not. And you're frustrated, you're trying to help them but they're resistant, which is natural, because that will be us one day, <laughs> you know? That will be us one day. But that's what the Jonah way looks like. A lack of peace and anxiety. The Jonah way. But there's also the way of the apostles in the gospel today, where you have, again, people going about the ordinary course of their life, everything's in order, everything is calm, you have Peter and Andrew, they're washing their nets. You have James and John on the boat, they're fishermen. Everything is all good, fine and dandy. And then this person by Jesus, who they know already, it's not the first time they met him, but they know who he is. But now he walks along the shore. They know there's something special about him. And he says, come follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. That's it. Come follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Nothing else. A lot of mystery in there. What is it that they're going to do? And they get up and follow him. And they enter into the mystery because God is in the mystery. And so quickly, to wrap this up, to go back to that second reading, from now on, let those having wives act as not, as not having them. What does St. Paul mean by this? He means this. He means Enjoy the things of your life. Enjoy your marriage. Enjoy your families. Enjoy all the leisures of life. Enjoy it. Embrace it. Hold on to it. But when you hold on to those great things of life, have a light grasp to them. Don't cling and hold tightly as if you're going to have this thing forever. Everything of this world, we have to have a light grasp to it. Meaning that we're, when called upon, when circumstances change, when God is calling us to something else, to another stage of our life, we also, in the holding on to them, also must hold on to them in a way that we're also ready to let it go. I know it's not the most pleasant thing to hear, 
but it's necessary because everything in this world changes. The scenery changes. The set changes. And we're moving to a permanent end. We're moving to the permanent end of the kingdom of God, into the divine life of God. That is permanent and forever. That's where we're moving to. That's our final resting place. In the beloved embrace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's where we're, that's permanent. But everything else is a pilgrimage of life. Everything else is just a transition phase to that permanent phase. So live life, love it, cherish your families, cherish your health, Thank God for it. But also, when God asks us, be ready to let it go. Because he wants to give us something even greater, much greater than what we can even imagine. May God bless you.